Hello and welcome. Welcome to another lecture in the series of Target Prelims 2021. Now through these lecture series, we have been trying our level best to get you prepared for the prelims examination 20. If you like the content of the videos, like the video, share the video with your fellow aspirants and don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Now, that being said, today we are going to have the second lecture for environment and ecology. Yesterday, various factors regarding our ecosystem and environment at large. Today, we shall be concerned various important species which have been in news, different protected areas which have been in news, and also the relevant concept that we can gather from there for the perspective of the examination. So without further ado, let us begin and let us take a look at the questions. The first question, the term Bathynomus raxisa seen in the news is related to A. Traditional religious ritual practiced by the tribes in Arunachal Pradesh. B. Microscopic algae that caused mass deaths in elephants in Botswana. C. Supergiant isopod species found in the Indian Ocean. And D. Tree frog that is endemic to Western Ghats. So in this case, the answer shall be C that is supergiant isopod species found in the Indian Ocean. Now, this particular species that we are talking about, it is nothing but a kind of a giant sea cockroach which was found recently in the region of Eastern Indian Ocean. Now, because of its size, as its size is close to around 50 centimeters in length, that is why it has been ascribed a name, Bathynomus. Now, these particular species, they move on the ocean floor. And they have a kind of a special phenomena and their life cycle, which pretty much resembles that of a cockroach. This is under the classification of an isopod. Isopods are your general crustaceans that you have. Sometimes certain species of crabs, shrimps, etc. can also be subclassified under the genus isopod. Now these particular species, they, when they roam about on the ocean floor, they are under the category of scavengers. So they basically feed on the dead remains and the dead animals such as larger whales, fishes, etc. But oftentimes go without food for many days altogether. And this particular property is very such. And that is why they have been classified under the same genus. And it is actually predicted that they have been inhabiting the earth for a very long time. Okay. So for this particular species, you have to be aware of what they eat. So because they are scavengers, they feed on dead matter, the detritus food chain as we refer to. And now recently in Kerala, while the biologists were touring through and were looking for different types of species, they came upon a species of dragonfly. And that dragonfly was special because it had tissues of both male and female variety. Now this particular ability or this particular property of phenomena exhibited by any life form to have both male as well as female tissues, that is referred to as gynandromorphism. Now this has basically been derived from multiple different small words. Gain refers to the female, aner refers to the male, and morphism refers to the change. Now this particular discovery is particularly important. And why is that? First of all, these properties are found in various different types of animals and various different types of butterflies. Basically, it is the butterflies who exhibit this particular property in significant amount. 
Now, gynandromorphism is resulted because of certain chromosomal change that you have. And it is because of this internal change in the body. And that change oftentimes is basically forced upon an organism due to climate change, due to change in the external stimuli or the environment, and thereby the species adapts. Now this particular ability is important because now it opens doors for various researchers. What kind of researchers? So you must be aware and you would have read it under science and tech as well that there are certain types of diseases which plague the female gender in particular. And there are certain diseases both communicable or rather mainly non-communicable and lifestyle diseases which target the male population. So if we are able to understand that how a species can develop both these tissues, thereby can lie a cure to some of the most dangerous diseases that we are facing in the present day and age. And that is why gynandromorphism is very important moving ahead when it comes to medical research and that has been derived basically, it was observed basically from a species of dragonfly. Right? A dragonfly which was found in the wetlands of Kerala. Now, let us take a look at the options. It is characteristic of an organism that has both male and female tissues. So the first statement or the first option in itself is correct. Anyways, if you take a look at the next level or the next different statements which are listed, it is the mechanism through which an organism enters into hibernation. That is not a change that an organism makes. It is just a state in which the organism is. So hibernation, estivation, all of that we shall be looking as well as we move forward. It is a process in which an organism uses another organism's body to lay eggs, obviously not. And it is a form of adaptation mechanism by certain organisms in response to climate change. So one thing that you have to keep in mind here, that this particular ability or property of gynandromorphism many of the times is triggered due to climate change. Okay? It doesn't help or allow the organism to adapt to climate change but it is oftentimes triggered because of that. Okay? So the first statement or the first option is correct. Now, moving on to the next question. The next question is, the term Dickinsonia, recently seen in the news, is related to which of the following? First, it is an extinct species or subspecies of archaic humans that ranged across Asia during the Middle Paleolithic age. Second, the oldest species of dinosaurs recently found in South America. So this is a incorrect. Third, it is an extinct genus of basal animals that lived during the late Ediacaran period. Now this is the correct option. Now, the next option was newly discovered invasive species of plant. So, Dickinsonia made significant amount of news in our country this particular year. It is a kind of a, and why it made news was because a giant fossil was found in the caves of Bimbetka in Madhya Pradesh. As you must be aware, that Bimbetka is also important for your art and culture. So that is why when you study Bimbetka now for petroglyphs or the various different art forms which have been found there, understand that Dickinsonian fossils have also been found there. So what is this Dickinsonia? It is basically one of the largest animal remains which have been found going back as long as around 550 to 570 million years. And these particular animals, if you look at it, the fossils that you find are of a kind of a shape of a leaf. But as we saw in the question statement itself, 
these are basal animals what are basal animals so certain types of animals such as giant squids sponges even certain types of corals they can be classified into the species of basal animals now dickinsonia and its fossils and its remains have already been found in various different parts of the world it has been found in the regions around russia in the region around ukraine china australia so in these parts of the globe already these remains have been found and it is assumed that these used to live and these organisms used to live in shallow waters waters which were not very deep and finding of this fossil and these remains in bimbetka in madhya pradesh also tells you some part about the geological history of that place after all if these were the species which were found in shallow waters that tells you that at some point in geological history of the planet the region around madhya pradesh would also have been submerged but more importantly the remains which have been found in bimbetka they have a glaring similarity to the remains which were found in australia not similarity with the remains to be found in russia ukraine or china and that again gives you a kind of a confirmation that long time ago these places and different land masses were actually the part of a larger supercontinent so thereby this dickinsonian revelation as it is referred to is particularly important for us to understand the geological history but also the ecological life form which existed no such life form having such a greater size has been found in its intact shape and it is basically found in various different sedimentary rocks so it is generally found in all the different areas that we have seen it is generally found in sandstone deposits which are again sedimentary rocks and it is not a mere coincidence that basically madhya pradesh is also very rich in limestone and limestone again has got a marine origin so that again tells you that this portion had been submerged at some point of time in its history okay now moving ahead to the next question now the next question deals with the recovery program for endangered species so this particular program has been launched by the government to take care of the habitat of the wildlife living in that habitat and also to ensure that certain species which are threatened in our our country in particular they are taken care of and for that the government has been providing grants to various different areas and various different protected regions where these species are to be found and where they are present okay so which of the following species are part of the recovery program for critically endangered species so here you have the first option that is carousel this is an animal which is found not only in india but also in the regions of africa western part of asia etc but when it comes to india its population is severely threatened and its population is reducing day by day due to loss of habitat so we shall be looking at carousel separately as well so yes this is actually included in that then snow leopard as you know snow leopard is also one of those animals sighting of which is very rare even though the united nations or rather iucn has put it under the vulnerable category but still their population is not very high so yes snow leopard is also correct now here again we shall try the elimination method 
So we know that 1 and 2 are the correct options. If I take a look at the answer statements, wherever 1 is not present, immediately I eliminate it out. Now I am left with only two options. So here again you will see that there is only one option which count or there is only one option which counts for both 1 and 2 being correct. So that automatically brings you to the correct answer. But anyways, Malabar Sivat is again a kind of an endangered or is an endangered species which is found in the southern part of the country and northern river terrapin has been added recently to this list. So all the four are actually correct and all the four have been included in the recovery program for critically endangered species. Let us try to understand a bit more about this recovery program, what this recovery program is about. So this particular recovery program, as you can see, is one of the sub-components of Integrated Development of Wildlife Habitats, or IDWH. Now, it is a centrally sponsored scheme. This again becomes important, whether it is a central, central sector scheme or centrally sponsored scheme. You have to be aware of that. Now, even though this IDWH was launched way back and there have been various different modifications and adjustments which have been carried on to the program subsequently, but here the basic criteria and the basic purpose, if you will observe, is to provide support and support for wildlife conservation. So there are three distinct types of support which is provided. First is basically providing support to protected areas. So many of the protected areas of the country, including national parks, wildlife sanctuaries, etc., many of these protected areas, they have these particular species which are endangered. So in order to help those protected areas to preserve the habitat in a better way, there is a kind of a funding provided by the center. So for non-recurring deposits or non-recurring expenditures for these protected areas, center provides 100% funds. For non-recurring expenditures, for example, suppose you have to create a separate kind of pond or a separate water hole for certain animal, the center will provide money and 100% assistance for that. For certain recurring um, expenditures, for example, ensuring that the wild or the dry twigs are taken out, etc., 50% of funding is provided by the center. But that too, the funding will be provided only in those areas which don't already receive funding under Project Tiger. Because many of the important protected areas of our country they already get significant amount of funding under the aegis of Project Tiger. So those protected areas which are not covered under Project Tiger, they shall be provided funds under IDWH. Then protection of wildlife outside protected areas. So in this case, a report is to be prepared by the chief warden and as per that expenditure report, again, 100% expenditure will be provided or 100% funding will be provided for non-recurring expenditure and 50% for recurring expenditure. Now, recovery programs for saving critically endangered species and habitats. Here, funding shall be provided to ensure that the habitats are in place. Now, when we talk about habitats, why do habitats require funding? So for example, certain species, they thrive in grassland kind of ecosystem. Now if suppose in certain area, let's say the Nilgiris, where these particular species are prevalent, if suppose there is a lack of the grassland ecosystem, there shall be a creation of one. So habitat is equally important. 
and more particularly so many of the times what happens is that there are isolated protected areas protected areas you will observe that many states have multiple of these but between them you will find there are suburbs villages etc so these protected areas oftentimes they are joined together by what is referred to as wildlife corridors now what these wildlife corridors achieve is they allow the animals to roam they allow the animals to mingle and thereby they promote a kind of a genetic diversity any animal or any species greater the amount of genetic diversity that they have within themselves better they are or better equipped they are rather in order to face any adversity of nature so wildlife corridors are particularly important for preserving the species and many of the species if you will observe they are declining in population because of an absence of this connecting wildlife corridor so under the third heading or under the third provision of funding funds are provided in priority wherever you require to construct such corridors in order to ensure a continuity of the habitats in fact one of the species that we saw carousel was particularly influenced and has been particularly influenced and their population has been declining continuously because of this lack of connecting corridors in their habitats anyways taking a look at the different species which are covered under this program so asian wild buffalo asiatic lion sangai deer which is particularly imported in the region of manipur and it is to be found only in manipur rather edible nest swiftlet then gangetic river dolphin great indian bustard hangul indian rhino jordan's corsa and so on as you can see many different species have been covered under the program from an examination perspective you are expected to know something or just the name of these species the question will not be asked that list all the names but the question might be asked that which of these species are covered under it and which have not been covered it under it so thereby it is important for you to have a slight inkling of which are the species now one of the species which has been making significant amount of news is carousel which has been recently added so carousel is a kind of an animal which belongs to the whole species or the larger group of cats and they have a particular important characteristic as you can observe they have a particularly elongated ear which is black in fact the name carousel in itself has been derived from the turkish word that is kara kural again this kara kural refers to having black ears right so if you observe it then carousel is an animal which is found not only in india but significantly in the region around iran western part of asia as well as in africa when you consider the carousel population in africa and west asia it is huge and there this particular animal is put under the category of least concern because their population is huge now in india this is put under the category of critically endangered because in our country its population has been declining at a very significant pace now what kind of ecosystem do these carousels thrive in so typically you will observe that they tend to thrive in grassland ecosystem now even you will find the records of carousel to be present in our historical data and the historical scripts 
In fact, carousel is one of those animals whose details you will, you will find in even Abul Fazl's Akbar Nama. Even in Shah Nama you will find that. And in fact, all the rulers of the Delhi Sultanate were also known for using this as a hunting cat. And they used to help the rulers and also the elite class to hunt various different animals. And that is why carousel has always been in prominence in our society. But lately what has happened, due to reclamation of more amount of dry areas and drier lands for agricultural purposes, these carousels, their habitat has been declining in area. Typically, if you observe the badland topography around the Chambal region or the Chambal river valley, there in the drier areas and in the badland and the ravine erosion which has been carried out, in those areas you have a significant proportion and significant population of carousels. But under general governmental and administrative practices, what is the norm is that whenever you come across an area which has a badland topography or which is not put under irrigation or agriculture, immediately government efforts are made to reclaim that land and bring it under agriculture. And because of this, those animals which thrive in such kind of topography and who have thrived in this kind of topography historically, those animals, they continue to decline. So all the areas where thorny forests are also present, where the land is being reclaimed, the carousel population is coming down. And this population is being hurted significantly due to lack of connecting corridors. So wherever you have connecting corridors, they are able to move about freely. But because of lack of connecting corridors, many of the times they are restricted to a smaller area. And if the population declines in that smaller area, maybe due to a disease, maybe due to sudden lack of rainfall or a change in rainfall pattern, etc., the animals, they begin to die. And that is why in India, they are critically endangered. So for carousel, please remember a particular point. They are an animal which has been subcategorized under the category of least concern in Africa because their population is huge. But then in India, it is critically endangered. Okay? Now, moving on to the next important topic which remains important whenever you appear for the examination. So even if you were appearing previous year or this year or next year, wetlands and Ramsar convention is always going to remain important. So let us quickly go through what do we mean by wetlands and what are Ramsar sites. So as you can see from the picture and the figure itself, wetlands are those areas where there is a kind of a submergence under water. And you will observe that water covers the soil overall or is present either at or near the surface of the soil all year for or for some part of the year. So you have a kind of a condition where water covers the region. Now please understand, here one has to be careful that one doesn't confuse between a kind of a wetland as well as a kind of a swamp or marsh. Swamps and marshes, even though they might seem to be similar, they are very different. In swamps, oftentimes you will have forested areas. You have trees which are partly submerged. In marshes, you have an absolute lack of trees and you have a kind of a declining vegetation. In the case of wetlands, these wetlands can be found even in coastal areas, in areas sometimes where the water simply flows back from the ocean. 
or the sea nearby or in the river flood plains or in low lying areas which receive very high amount of rainfall during certain parts of the year. Now these wetlands are particularly important for our ecosystem. How? So not only do they serve an important purpose in the longer food chain or rather food web. If you consider the food web, you will find that various different varieties of fishes and birds, they feed on these wetlands. How? Because as you can see that you have many different types of grasses which are submerged. So oftentimes what happens is that few of these grasses, they die and they start decomposing. Thereby, these grasses, they serve to be as a nutritious food or the decomposing part of them, they serve as a nutritious food for the fishes. And once the small fishes and their population starts going up, then the population of the migratory birds also go up. Here we have to keep in mind that many of the species, many of the birds which are migratory in nature, that is they move from one area to the other between different seasons in order to carry out the vital life cycles or their reproductory cycles. So all these birds generally will find that they move from the region around Central Asia or the region around Siberia and they move to the region around India and Southeast Asia in order to carry out or in order to stay there and feed themselves during the winter months and the winter season. And why do they do that? Because during the winter months, the temperature in the regions to the north of Central Asia or to the north of Siberia, that becomes abnormally harsh. So in order to protect themselves, they migrate. And where do they migrate? They migrate into these wetlands. They stay there. Many of the cases we find that they even reproduce and then the young ones fly back away with the whole flock. So the whole corridor that you see from the region around northern part of Asia, in fact the whole of Eurasia, the Central Asian countries and up till the southern part of Asia, that is also sometimes referred to as the Central Asian flyway and this is very important for the survival of these migratory species. So what happens when the percentage or the number of these wetlands they start decreasing? These birds which travel thousands of kilometers they lose their nesting grounds. And when they lose their nesting grounds, they are unable to reproduce or their young ones, they die very quickly and thereby the population of the birds also starts declining. So by taking care of the wetlands, we ensure that overall population and the biodiversity is maintained. Now, in the 1970s, you had the Ramsar Convention. Ramsar Convention was basically held in the Iranian city of Ramsar in 1971 and it was brought into force in 1975. Now this convention is typically in order to have a kind of a conservation or the ideation of best practices for conservation of wetlands and is a kind of an intergovernmental treaty. This word is also important. In many of the multiple choice questions, you do find a statement where UPSC does ask you whether it is an intergovernmental treaty, whether it is a voluntary or rather a treaty between NGOs, etc. So it is an intergovernmental treaty. That means that once you are ascribing to or once you are adopting this con convention, 
the government is bound to preserve or at least take care of these particular wetlands. Now, in order to ensure that the particularly vulnerable wetlands are taken care of and they are preserved with the best practices as is observed across the globe, there is a record which is kept and that is the Montreux record. So, those particular wetlands which are very vulnerable or which are very threatened, they are listed under Montreux record. If their health or if their situation gets better, then those wetlands are removed from the Montreux record. Okay? Now, recently on 30th August, that is 2021, the 75th session of United Nations General Assembly, they adopted 2nd February of each year as World Wetlands Day. And meanwhile, the whole decade, that is the decade of 2021 to 2030, already is being celebrated by United Nations as a decade for conserving or preserving the ecosystem. So that is why, Wetland conservation gains particular importance because it is one of the most vital ecosystems. So what happens if the wetlands start drying up? And by the way, yesterday we talked about the paddy irrigation and in many of the paddy fields you have flooding irrigation which is carried out where you inundate the field with water. Those also serve as temporary wetlands. So, due to global warming and due to various unsustainable agricultural practices, the water from these wetlands are being drained out and houses and other construction activities are being carried out there. Now, once you drain the water out of the wetland, all the remaining dead, decomposed or decomposing or dying floral and faunal species they will always emit huge amount of methane. So, these wetlands, even though they are good emitters of methane, but a dried out wetland becomes simply disastrous. Wetlands, furthermore, they help you in purifying the groundwater. And once you have an area which is under water cover, Thereby, let's suppose a coastal area is already having a wetland, you will also find mangroves growing there if you have salty and saline water. And that is where many of the times these wetlands, they also serve as a purpose of preventing a kind of a disaster happening in the coastal areas. So, the mangroves and the wetlands, they will act as a buffer against, let's say, a storm surge caused by a tropical cyclone in the coastal area or even a tsunami which is caused. So hence, it is very, very important. But then, why are we going across wetlands this particular year? Because this year, again, India has added four more wetlands under the Ramsar sites. So, in total now, India has around 46 sites which are designated as wetlands of international importance and they have been designated as Ramsar sites. Which are these wetlands? These are and two of them are actually situated in Haryana and two of them are situated in Gujarat. So, you have Bindawas Wildlife Sanctuary, it is a kind of a bird sanctuary. It is present in the region around Jhajjar in Haryana flyway and what is it and why is it important. So whenever you hear about Central Asian flyway, always think that these are very important in the life cycle of migratory birds, okay, who are moving from the northern latitudes towards the lower latitudes and lower regions during the winter months. Then you have the Vadwana wetland from Gujarat 
and again it is internationally important for bird, li uh, bird life as it provides wintering ground and the species which again migrate on the Central Asian flyway. So these particular four different wetlands which have been added, they form important portion for current affairs. Ideally you should know which of these have been added and also the total number of Ramsar sites which is present in our country. Now, let us take a look at the types of questions which can be framed from here. So, with respect to the physical attributes of wetlands, consider the following statements. The first statement is, the substrate in the wetland is covered by water or has waterlogged soil for at least a few days during the growing season of each year. So it can be during the time of pre-monsoon shower, during the time of monsoon itself, sometimes during post-monsoon. So at least during some portion of the year or the other, the land has to be covered by water. So this is correct. The second statement is, the wetland substrate is predominantly undrained hydric soil. Undrained hydric soil here, even though it might seem very complicated term. But break it down. Undrained means where water has accumulated, it has not gone out. Hydric means the soil has got ample supply of water. So yes, in the case of wetlands, you have such kind of soil which is present underneath. So this is also correct. The third is, thermal stratification occurs in all wetlands. So what is this thermal stratification? Is it observed in wetlands? If not, where is it observed? So again, break it. Stratification refers to arrangement in various different layers. So thermal stratification refers to arrangement of water in different layers based upon the temperature. We know that water having a higher temperature will have much lower density and water having lower density will tend to float on top. Water having a kind of a higher density will tend to sink below. So that is where when we talk about the term thermal stratification, it is where you will find that very warm water or significantly warmer water will lie on top and comparatively colder water or rather cooler water will stay at the bottom. Now, when we saw the picture of wetlands, was the water deep enough to undergo a thermal stratification? No. So that is why the third statement is incorrect. So where is this thermal stratification found then? It is to be found across the major oceans and the seas across the globe. So even in the region around Bay of Bengal, you will find that because so much of fresh water is being brought about by various different rivers, this fresh water being lighter and being less denser than the saline water present in Bay of Bengal, this fresh water tends to stay and float on top, whereas the denser and the saline water stays at the bottom. Often times, this lighter or less dense water becomes much more warmer and thereby you attain the state of stratification in the region of Bay of Bengal. That is also one of the primary reasons why Bay of Bengal actually goes through or observes so many tropical cyclones to be formed. Because when the thermal stratification of water is attained, it is much easier for the surface water to gain temperature or to gain heat. And if the temperature of the upper layer of water or any part of water exceeds around 27, 28 degrees Celsius, ideal conditions start prevailing for the formation of tropical cyclones. So overall, I hope now you understand what is the meaning of the word 
thermal stratification. But anyways, in this, the first and the second statements are correct. The third statement is incorrect. We have to find out the correct statement. So in this case, the correct answer will be A, that is 1 and 2. Okay? Now, moving on to the next question. With respect to the recently declared Ramsar wetland sites, consider the following statements. First, the total number of Ramsar wetlands in India has gone up to 45. Is it true? It is not. It has gone up to 46 with four recent additions. So the first statement is incorrect. Take a look at the options given. Wherever one is given as correct, eliminate it. So, you will end up eliminating three different options. So, automatically, without going to the second and the third statement, still you will be able to reach the correct answer. But let us go through them. Chandratal became the first Ramsar wetland site in Maharashtra. Now, Chandratal, where is it situated? It is situated in the region of Himachal Pradesh. So, the second statement is going to be incorrect. The third statement, that is, Uttar Pradesh has the most number of Ramsar sites in India, that is in fact correct. And that brings you to the answer that is B3 only. Uttar Pradesh has got around eight different Ramsar sites, which are largest in number across the country when you compare it on the state-wise distribution. Now, again, with reference to the Sokar wetland complex, which of the following statements are incorrect? First, it is an A1 category important bird area as per the BirdLife International and a key staging site in the Central Asian Flyway. Now, before we analyze whether the statement is correct or not, what is the meaning of A1 category important bird area? So, BirdLife International is a kind of a non-profit which works for identification of important areas or important ecosystems and habitats which are very important in the life cycle of various different birds, local birds, migratory birds, etc. Thereby, it classifies the important bird areas into various different categories, A1, A2, A3, A4. Now, this categorization is done dependent upon how threatened or under how much danger a particular species is. So when we talk about an A1 category, we are talking about those species of birds which are globally threatened and whose population globally is threatened. So such an area where these kinds of birds who are in very limited number across the world, when they come to breed or when they migrate to certain areas, that particular region or wetland is classified under A1 category, important bird area. Thousands of important bird areas exist across the globe. And that classification or that designation is done by BirdLife International. So, Sokar wetland is one of these, so this is in fact correct. The second statement, it consists of Startsapukso and Sokar lakes. So, Sokar wetland is a larger saline ecosystem and it consists of two smaller ecosystems or two smaller lake complexes that you have. One is the Startsapukso and the other is the Sokar. Here, So always refers to lakes. All that Somoriri, Pangong So, Sokar, here the term So always refers to lakes under the local Ladakhi language as well. 
So here, this statement is also true. In fact, along the margins of this particular lake, this is particularly well known, that you will find fringes of salt deposits. And that have been carried out because of evaporation of water. And because the water is so saline, you have salt coming to the surface as well across the fringes. So both these statements are rather correct. And we had to find out the incorrect statement. So that is where we will, we will see that the answer here will be option D, that is neither 1 nor 2. Now for the whole of the wetlands, again I will emphasize that you have to keep a track of these four, Bindavas, Sultanpur, then Thol Lake, as well as Vadwana. Now if you take a look at the location of it, then on the map, if you will observe, these two locations, they represent the one which is present in Haryana, that is Sultanpur, as well as the Vindavas. Now here, you will find this is the kind of Thol Lake. Here, this one, represents the soaker. Here you will find that you have Wooler Lake which is again a wetland. Okay? And here you will find the Vadwana. Here you will find the other one that is Bindavas. Okay? So accordingly, this data is available on the site of Ramsar as well. You can go there and you can look at all the different wetlands which have been designated. And as you can see, the largest concentration is in Uttar Pradesh, which we have seen earlier. Okay? Now, after that, coming to another question. Consider the following statements. Gharials are found in Girwa and Gandak rivers. 2. Salt water crocodiles are found only in Andaman and Nicobar Islands. 3. Magar crocodiles are not found in coastal seawater lagoons of Kerala. So, the first statement in itself. Gharials are found in Girwa and Gandak rivers. This is correct. Because if you look at the Gharial population, Gharial population is particularly thriving in the river Ganga and all its various tributaries. Girwa, Gandak, Son, in all these, you will find a significant amount of Gharial population to be present. Now, Yesterday, when we were talking about solving multiple choice questions, I had given a kind of an advice that whenever you come across absolute terms in a statement, most often than not, those statements are incorrect. If you take a look at the second and the third statement, that is, they are found only in Andaman, and they are not found, both of them are absolute. So they are actually incorrect, both of them. So, which of the above statements are correct? A, one only. Now, what is the difference between a mugger and a saltwater crocodile? Both of them belong to the same larger species group. They have been prevailing across the globe for a very long time now. But then, there is a minute difference between them. A mugger Oftentimes, you will find a mugger to be present in freshwater ecosystem. Oftentimes, you will find them to be present in freshwater ecosystems. It is a different matter altogether that you will also find their presence to be prevalent sometimes in saltwater ecosystem. But saltwater crocodiles mostly will be found in salty and saline conditions. Now, another difference is that salt water crocodiles are generally larger in size. And 
that has to do and their weight is also larger their length often times is up to around six to six and a half meters long sometimes it can go that big whereas muggers they are generally four to five meters long sometimes R rather six feet and four to five feet so saltwater crocodiles they are often times much larger and why is it so because mostly they are found in biodiversities wherever salt water is present they are kind of marginal seas etc so they have a kind of a larger ecosystem which is prevalent when you talk about evolution of species evolution is oftentimes shaped depending upon the biodiversity or rather the habitat that you are living in and it is said that because the salt water crocodiles have been living in larger and much open ecosystem they are able to grow up to the size of around six and six and a half feet whereas the muggers their size is oftentimes restricted now what is their distribution across the country gharial population as i already reiterated they can be found within the ganges and the whole Ganges river systems including the tributaries the saltwater crocodile they live in the mangroves of Bhitar Kanika, Sundarbans, Mahanadi Delta as well as the swamp lands of Odisha and West Bengal and other coastal areas of Andaman and Nicobar so you will find they live in coastal areas coastal areas they are known for saline water Magar lives in fresh water but also sometimes in certain small lagoons as well okay now an interesting fact to note here is that of all the various different regions in our country Odisha is one such state where you find all the three varieties to be living there Gharials were not present initially Gharials were introduced into that ecosystem but then very quickly along the river system of Mahanadi their population started growing and that is where Odisha is the only particular state in our country which can boast of having all these three in significant numbers recently the Odisha government went a step further and they announced a kind of a cash incentive in order to preserve the gharials because what happens is that many of the times near the river banks the hatchlings or the young ones of the gharials they look very similar to that of a crocodile so the ignorant population living in that area oh, it is very obvious that everybody will be scared of a crocodile so often times they indulged in killing those hatchlings and thereby threatening the gharial population that is why odisha government has declared rupees 1000 cash incentive for every gharial life which is saved and this can go a long way in preserving the gharial population as well if you look at the basic difference which exists between that of a gharial or a crocodile this can also be relevant for the examination so the basic difference is to be observed in the snout the gharials have a long snout in their mouth and the actual width up till which their mouth opens is not as wide enough as that of a mugger or a crocodile and that is why gharials will always feed on smaller prey they feed on small fishes and in general the smaller prey that they have mind you they have much larger number of teeth as compared to that of a crocodile but still overall if you will compare then their biting force is much less that is why they are not able to feed upon the land animals and they are oftentimes not at all dangerous to human population as well but it is when we confuse them with crocodiles that is when we start killing the gharials okay now 
moving on to the next topic or the next question that is of golden tiger. Now often times when you have visited a zoo, you would have observed a golden tiger, right? But then golden tigers, they rarely appear in the wild. This particular yellowish gold color that a tiger gains sometimes, that is actually because of inbreeding. When the tigers of a particular area, they breed amongst themselves. So it is not common in the wild. And that is why you find such cases in the zoos. But recently, India's only golden tiger was found in one of the protected areas. Which was that protected area? That particular protected area was A, Kaziranga National Park. And this existence of a golden tiger, while this is being celebrated, because obviously it is viewed in the wild for the first time, but it can also show dangerous ramifications, which tells you that tiger population is not intermingling, due to which the genetic diversity is being curbed. So even though it is important to preserve these golden tigers as well, but overall we should ensure a greater intermingling of the tiger population. So a question can appear that are golden tigers to be found in zoos and other protected environment? You have to understand that yes, they are. But in the wild, they are extremely rare. Because in the wild, they go for intermingling with different groups. Okay? Now, next question. With reference to Brahma Kamal flower, consider the following statements. Now, this picture that you see on the screen, that is a Brahma Kamal flower. So, here, the particular small or the particular property of this particular flower is that it will blossom or it will bloom only once. And that too, it blooms and it takes close to around two hours to bloom. And after sunset is when it blooms. It grows really big. Somewhere close to around six to seven inches is what it can grow in when it is in full bloom. But then it doesn't grow always. Or it doesn't bloom in all the conditions. It is found in the region around Uttarakhand. And it has been always granted a kind of an auspicious status. So this particular flower is actually offered as a tribute in various different shrines. All the shrines which are present in Uttarakhand especially, that is the Yamunotri, Gangotri, Kedarnath, Badrinath. In all those areas, you will find that this particular Brahma Kamal flower is offered. It has got certain medicinal values as well, but more than that, it is associated with the customs and the beliefs of that particular region. It is referred to as a king flower, and it is also said, basically, that you should never cut this flower. You should never buy this flower. You should get this flower only when someone offers it to you. So as I said, there is a lot of belief associated with this flower. But then we have to look at the environmental aspect. So the first statement, it is known as the king of Himalayan flowers. That is true. The second statement, it is the state flower of Uttarakhand. That is again true. The third statement, it blooms just once a year is also true. And here you have to keep in mind that not only once a year, but after sunset is when it blooms and it takes close to around one and a half to two hours to get to the full bloom. So here all the statements we have to find out which of them are correct. So in this case option D that is one, two and three all of them are correct. Now moving on to the next question. The next question is Ushira Joshi which was recently in the news is related to which of the following? First, 
it is a new species of ant. Second, it is a newly discovered medicinal plant species. Third, it is a non-venomous snake species discovered in Arunachal Pradesh. Fourth, it is a type of subterranean fish found in the caves of Meghalaya. So here, you have to understand that this is a kind of an ant species which has been discovered in the region of Kerala and Tamil Nadu. Now here the term Joshi has been attached or such name has been ascribed after the famous evolutionary biologist that we have that is Amitabh Joshi. It is after his name that you have a kind of the word associated as well. So it is a kind of a rare ant species which have got around 10 antennae. So when it comes to ants, their diversity is basically known on the basis of the number of antennae that they possess. So this particular ant species has got around 10 antennae and that is why it is considered to be particularly important and very rare. So discovery was made very recently. So you have to keep in mind what it is and where was it from. Okay? Now, next we move on to the topic or the concept rather of having a species being named as an indicator species or what is a species when we refer to a species as a flagship species, a keystone species. What is that all about? So when we talk about indicator species, as the name suggests, they give us an indication about the area around them. So sometimes when the environment is pristine and crystal clear, many of the species they will thrive in numbers. Sometimes when you will find that a particular kind of environment or ecosystem is polluted, then certain species they start declining in number. For example, take the case of coral reefs. Now when we talk about coral reefs, these grow generally in stable salt saline water having an adequate temperature range between 24 to 25 degrees Celsius in general. But as soon as the temperature of the water starts going up, due to global warming, due to oceanic warming, etc. Or if in certain oceanic waters, let's say there is a kind of a pollution and oil spill, or there is a great amount of mud which is being circulated, then these corals, they start dying. And that helps us understand that the ecosystem is under threat. Similarly, take the case of lichens as well. Now, lichens, they are again indicators and they are basically pollution indicators. Why? Because these lichens will thrive in an area where you don't have significant amount of pollution. So in India, you will find the significant population of lichens to be present in the region around Himachal Pradesh, Jammu and Kashmir as well as Uttarakhand, all those areas where you have a kind of a pristine environment. So whenever pollution starts increasing, these lichens, their population starts decreasing. And similarly, sometimes when the radiation and the various different ultraviolet rays, they start increasing in the atmosphere, lichen population again starts decreasing. So here you will observe that there are other different types of indicators as well. Corals and lichens we have seen. There is crayfish, which gives us an idea whether the water is fresh or not. As soon as the water will have more salt present in the form of magnesium, potassium or calcium sulfate, crayfish population significantly declines. Then other than that, you also have the peregrine falcons. They are also indicator species and they help us understand the pesticide loads. So these falcons, when they feed on dead animals or certain dead remains, if there is pesticide present in them, the population of the falcons also start going down. 
So by monitoring the indicator species of a particular region, you will always be able to garner an idea about the health of the ecosystem. That is why certain species have been categorized under indicator species. Then the next category is keystone species. Now keystone means something which is very important for the whole structure. So keystone species are those species whose survival, whose population and whose thriving numbers very much determine whether the whole food web or the whole ecosystem is in balanced state or balanced condition or not. So they play an essential role in the structural functioning or productivity of a habitat or an ecosystem. So for example, when you consider seed dispersal, there the role of certain birds are particularly important role of certain kinds of monkeys, bats, etc. are particularly important. If these monkeys or bats would not be feeding on those fruits and throwing the seeds here and there, the plants would not be able to germinate or reproduce naturally. And thereby, it would mean a kind of a declining ecosystem diversity. Similarly, take the case of elephants. Elephants they again, these are a kind of animals which will thrive in a grassland ecosystem. And there again you will observe that it is because the elephants, they will immediately pluck out the fresh grasses or rather the fresh saplings. They don't allow the growth or significant uh, increase in the population of the tree cover. They let the tree cover remain in a limited amount so that there is a prevalence of an overall grassland ecosystem due to which various different other animals can also roam about freely. Many of the animals, they won't thrive properly in dense forests. Larger animals such as giraffes, such as lions, they will never be even zebras, rhinos, they will never be able to thrive in dense tropical rainforest. They require a kind of a grassland ecosystem and elephant is a keystone species which ensures that. Other than that, you also have the example of sharks. These sharks, even though when you think about it, it oftentimes brings about a kind of a danger, but then these sharks, they continuously feed on the fishes. Now fishes, they reproduce in huge numbers. So if in any waters there is a declining shark population, there is an explosion in the fish population. But the food for the fishes is always going to be limited. There is not going to be an unlimited supply of food. That will put the fish population in danger and at risk as well. That is why you need the existence of a top predator like shark to ensure a balance in the marine ecosystem. So these are under the category of keystone species. Then you have another category, the category of species which are classified as flagship species. Now what are these flagship species? These are basically iconic species. And they help you recognize and identify a kind of an ecosystem or a kind of a protected area just by thinking about that species. For example, if you take a look at this picture of a Royal Bengal tiger, mostly you will think about an ecosystem of a deciduous forest or maybe Sundarbans itself. Because Royal Bengal tiger is a flagship species of such kinds of ecosystems. So certain species, for example, snow leopard. Snow leopard is very important even as a keystone species in certain mountainous areas, but more importantly, when you consider the mountainous ecosystem, in many of these mountainous ecosystems, snow leopard forms a flagship species. So that is the importance of these species. Why do we have this classification in the first place? 
it is done so that the administration and the government can take steps because it is not easy to monitor the degradation or the degeneration of the environment around you. It is only when you observe that, okay, the population of elephants are going down, that means the ecosystem must also be threatened. The population of, let's say, lichens are going down, that means the pollution level must also be going up. So it helps you take administrative decisions based upon the monitoring of these particular species. So questions can be framed from this, from the perspective of their importance, what they are, and which are the kind of species under them. Okay? Let's take a look at the type of question. So, which of the following are indicator species of an ecosystem? Now, lichens, yes, they are. Then tigers, they are not the indicator species. Then you have the peregrine falcons, which give us an idea about the pesticide load in an area. So the third statement is also correct. So you have the correct answer will be C. That is 1 and 2. Now, there is another classification. And that classification generally you will find to be having the umbrella species. Sometimes umbrella species are also a kind of a keystone species. Tiger is oftentimes cited as an example of the umbrella species. Even sharks, for that matter, are oftentimes cited as an example of umbrella species. What are these umbrella species? These are those animals which basically sit at the top of the food web. Now, if these animals are eliminated from the whole ecosystem, the whole food web, the food chain will go haywire. And the balance in environment shall be disturbed. And that is why, because of their overarching presence on the food chain and the food web, they are referred to as an umbrella species as well. This, I'm just giving it out so that when you come across this statement in the question paper, you should not be surprised. Okay? Now, another question. Consider the following statement with respect to lichens. First, they are composite organisms that live in a symbiotic relationship between algae and fungi. This is correct. So, lichens, they always represent the perfect example of symbiotic relationship. Even corals do that, but lichens are the best example. So, this is correct. Now, they grow fast and are short-lived. This is incorrect. Because not only do they grow at a very slow pace, but then their life cycle is also very large. Few of the lichens have a life cycle of around 100 years. So, that is where they have a very long life cycle. So the second statement will be incorrect. The third statement is, Uttarakhand has become the first state to develop India's first lichen park. Now, as I said already, that Uttarakhand, Himachal Pradesh, and Jammu and Kashmir, they are particularly well endowed with lichens. Out of all these, it is Uttarakhand which has got maximum number of different species of lichens. It has got more than 600 species of varieties of lichens. That is why in the region of Kumao, the geographical division of Kumao, more particularly in the area of Munsiari, you will find that Uttarakhand has set up the first lichen park of our country. And this has been set up to keep a track of pollution levels. Because we have seen, they will thrive only in air which is pure. When the air starts getting polluted, the Himalayan ecosystem will also start getting damaged. So it has been done with a larger aim 
to preserve and conserve the Himalayan ecosystem as well. And that is a very vulnerable ecosystem overall. So this is the correct statement. So you have 1 and 3 which are the correct answers. Now, moving on to the next question. Such species, now this is a para paragraph or a passage kind of question. So, such species are selected to act as an ambassador, icon or symbol for a defined habitat, issue, campaign or environmental cause. By focusing on and achieving conservation of that species, the status of many other species which share its habitat or are vulnerable to the same threats may be improved as well. Which of the following species is depicted in the above passage? So, which of them are an ambassador, an icon or a symbol for a designated habitat? It is the flagship species. So, this kind of question you can easily expect in the prelims examination. Moving on to the next question. An example of this kind of flagship species. Recently, the Chilika Development Authority has designated which of the following species as ambassador of Chilika Lake? A. Fishing Cat B. Olive Ridley Turtle C. Karyal or D. Iravadi Dolphin. So, in this case, the answer shall be A, that is fishing cat. Now, when you take a look at fishing cat, these are basically nocturnal animals and they feed themselves on fishes, frogs, small crustaceans such as prawns, crabs, etc., snakes, birds and few of the remains of the dead animals as well. Now, this fishing cat, by the way, is also the state animal of which particular state? West Bengal. So, it is the state animal of West Bengal as well. In fact, even if you have been following the political news during the recent Bengal elections, Many references were made to the fishing cat as well, political references obviously, but that is how you understand which particular animal is to be present in which region. Now, where are these particular fishing cats found? So, their main habitats are basically wetlands and hence they are to be found in the region around Chilika Lake, Bhitar Kanika, Sundarbans and also in the foothills of Himalayas, that is in the Tarai area. Tarai belt generally and also in the western Ghats. So, in these areas you tend to find the population of fishing cat. Okay? Now, moving on to the next question. Consider the following statements about whale sharks recently in the news. Now, whale sharks as you can again see from the figure itself, it is very important to have a kind of an image recall that you can do. In that case, memory recall becomes particularly easy. So, look at the image. This is the whale shark. This is one of the largest fishes which exist. And very little or very less amount is known about their population. And how do they reproduce or where do they reproduce? Mostly, they are seen to be roaming around the surface, feeding on planktons amongst various other things as well, such as fish, eggs, etc. And they are to be found in the tropical waters, that is warmer waters across the globe. But then, they are also known to be diving to the depth of around 1000 meters, 1 kilometer from the sea level. And that tells you that they have a kind of an adaptation mechanism as well. So, let us take a look at the statement. So, first, they feed only on tiny planktons. 
Here again, if you will observe, an absolute word is used only. Majority or most of the cases, this is incorrect. But here it is incorrect because these sharks or whale sharks, they also feed on certain fish eggs and certain smaller kind of nutrients as well. So this is again incorrect. Now look at the option. All the options where statement 1 is given as correct. Eliminate them. You will automatically reach the answer. But anyways, it is listed as endangered on the IUCN red list. Very correct. And it is to be found in all tropical oceans of the world. So it is to be found in the tropical waters across the globe. And because they are more suited to the warmer waters, their range is increasing day by day. What do we mean by that? So suppose, let us consider the globe. Now here, the warmer waters are generally to be present in the tropical areas. But due to global warming, and as we saw the case of La Nina condition yesterday as well, as the warmer waters and the extent of the warmer region is increasing, waters beyond the tropics are also getting warmer. And that is where the range of these kinds of animals are increasing quite significantly. Okay? Now, the third statement is correct here as well. Now, after that, Moving to another question, that is, with reference to the sea buckthorn, which was recently in news, consider the following statements. Now, first of all, why was sea buckthorn in news? And here, because the term sea is used, don't get confused that it is a marine species. This was in news because Himachal Pradesh government took a decision to encourage the growth and cultivation of sea buckthorn. Now, it is a kind of a wild shrub that you find. So, where do you find that? It is found in the region around Lahore and Spiti in Himachal, in the region around Ladakh in the north. So, in these areas, you generally find these kinds of shrubs which grow. And these shrubs, they give an orangish kind of a berry as a fruit. Now, this berry is particularly rich in vitamins, certain important vitamins such as vitamin A, B2, C, etc. So, vitamin C because due, during the COVID pandemic, we came upon the knowledge that vitamin C is very important for development of immunity. So all the different plant products which had vitamin C, their cultivation was encouraged across the globe. C. buckthorn is a kind of that particular shrub. Now here, there are other purposes which can be solved by their cultivation as well. So in all these areas, generally you will find a lack of vegetation being prevalent all year round because of extreme conditions. So the wind velocity in these areas, in these mountainous areas and mountainous regions, the wind velocity, the velocity of the runoff water in the streams, etc., is very high. Due to this, soil erosion is a major issue or is a major problem that this area faces. So if you have shrubs growing across the slopes or across these areas, these shrubs which can grow in these conditions, you can preserve the top layer of the soil as well, thereby preserving the ecosystem at a larger sense as well. Okay? So that is why the government of Himachal Pradesh is promoting the growth of C. Bakhthon. Now, the statements. It is a shrub found in the cold desert of India, yes, in the region around Lahore, Spiti and even in Ladakh. 
It helps in prevention of soil erosion. Yes. How? By covering the topsoil layer, by holding the topsoil in its place so that these deserts which experience very high velocity winds or even if it rains for one day or two, the streams have very great speed and they carry all the topsoil away. So yes, and its fruits are rich in vitamins and omega fatty acids as well. So all the three statements are correct. So the correct answer will be D, that is 1, 2 and 3. Okay? Here you also have to keep in mind about the Himachal Pradesh. Because it can be asked that a statement can be put forward that recently Kerala government has announced the growth or the cultivation of sea buckthorn. So thereby you can very easily get confused in such kinds of statements. Now, then consider the following pairs. Here in one column you have the state of inactivity, the other you have the kind of animal which practices that. So the first is estivation, second is hibernation and the third is diapause. What are these? So let us understand the broader concept first. Any particular animal when it undertakes or when rather it observes an extremely quick changing stimuli in the environment around itself, that particular animal oftentimes it adapts, it puts or it lowers the rate of metabolism in its body, thereby going for an elongated sleep cycle. And thereby once you lower the rate of metabolism, then your requirement of energy will reduce. So then you won't be spending the food that you have consumed and you shall be able to sustain for a longer period of time. So when we talk about estivation, it is a kind of a summer sleep. So in those ecosystems or those environments where many different uh, or where there is a significant amount of water stress during the summer season, many different animals such as snails, certain kinds of insects, etc., they undergo estivation. And they keep their body moist. They consume water and they lower their rate of metabolism. What is this rate of metabolism that I am talking about? Metabolism is how your body processes any kind of energy that you have or any kind of food that you have ingested. Metabolism converts that food into energy. So if you lower the rate of metabolism, you don't need to consume food or water anymore. So estivation is practiced by certain animals when the summer is harsh. Then you have hibernation. Hibernation is a kind of a winter sleep where when the winter conditions are going to be particularly harsh and drastic, many animals such as bats as is given in the, uh, here as well in the list as well and many other animals such as polar bears, they are an example of animals which undergo hibernation. So many of these animals, they simply consume enough amount of food before the winter season and they go into a long sleep. Going into the sleep cycle reduces their rate of metabolism and based upon the food that they had consumed before, they are able to sustain through the harsh environment. So hibernation and then you have diapause. Diapause is when you can lower the rate of metabolism at your own free will. And this is oftentimes practiced by certain small moths small insects, small caterpillars, etc. Now, whenever the external environment starts getting harsher, they go into the stage of diapause. Diapause, unlike estivation and hibernation, need not last for the whole seasonal cycle. It can be for a few weeks as well, a few days as well. Okay? So, each of these 
represent, each of these activities represent, and the animals which have been listed, they undergo these kinds of activities. Now, a question has been asked from hibernation in prelims earlier. Estivation and diapause can be asked in the coming exam. So here, which of these statements are correctly matched or which of the pairs are correctly matched? So all the three, that is one, two, and three, they are collect correctly matched. So the answer will be D. Now, moving on to the next question, the question regarding protected regions and protected areas across the globe. So the first question, first question for this is, with reference to the Asia Protected Areas Partnership, APAP, which of the following statements is or are correct? First, India will be the co-chair of Asia Protected Areas Partnership for the period of next three years till November 2023. Now, Asia Protected Areas Partnership is basically a program for all the various different countries in Asia. Because overall in Asia, you know that you have a total of around 10,900 protected areas. So in order to propagate the best practices, better knowledge, and also better conservation ideas, this is a partnership amongst various different member nations. And India has been a co-chair because India has been pretty much successful in increasing the population of the threatened species. So here, India will be the co-chair for the next three years. So this is the correct statement. The second statement is, it was launched by the United Nations Environment Program. Now this is incorrect because this has been launched by IUCN, or International Union for Conservation of Nature. The IUCN which comes up with the critically endangered, the vulnerable endangered and other lists. So IUCN is the one which is the monitoring or it was the body which launched this partnership. So here second is incorrect, so the answer will be A, that is one only. Okay? Now, here again a passage type question. It is a national park of the Northeast Indian region that has also been declared as important bird area. It is bordered by the Brahmaputra and Lohit rivers in the north and Dibru river in the south. In 1997, it was also declared as a biosphere reserve. Recently, the concerned state government has set a deadline for its forest department to rehabilitate the indigenous forest dwellers back to their protected area. So, which particular protected area are we talking about here? So, we are talking about, as the name of the river in itself suggests, we are basically talking about Dibru Saikova National Park, which is situated in the northeastern extent of Assam, bordering Arunachal. So that is where Dibru Saikova National Park is present. Okay? Next, consider the following pairs with reference to the biosphere reserve. Zone and the human activity which is allowed. First, core zone, non-destructive research. Can it be carried out? Yes, it can. So this is correctly matched. Second, transition zone, ecotourism. Now, ecotourism is carried out in which area? It is generally carried out in the buffer zone, right? Right next to the core zone. It is in the transition zone that you will find agricultural activities and other human activities taking place. So both two and three here, are rather incorrectly matched. So in this, the correct answer shall be A, that is one only. Now here you have to understand the basic concept of a core zone which lies at the center. Then right around it, you have the buffer zone. And basically on the outer extreme, 
you have the transition zone. It is in the transition zone that you end up finding human settlements as well as other activities such as agriculture taking place. Now the core zone is the one which is utmost critical where the species are to be present in their maximum density and they are to be present in that region. Buffer zone as the name suggests is a kind of a buffer between human settlements, the local villages that you will find and the core zone. The health of a habitat or a biosphere reserve is always determined by monitoring the health of the core zone. So when we talk about ecotourism, what is ecotourism? Ecotourism is when you promote tourism activities based upon the environmental and ecological wonder and diversity which is present. Rather than clearing all the trees and clearing all the forests, you take the tourists to appreciate the density or the diversity of the forest ecosystem. That is what is ecotourism. So ecotourism, can it be carried out in the transition zone? No, because the forest cover will be significantly less. Agricultural practices, can it be carried out in the buffer zone? No, because here human activities are pretty much curbed and they are limited. Okay? So this is the basic classification of a protected area that you will come across. Now, next, Karlapat Wildlife Sanctuary, which was recently in the news, is located in which of the following states? So here, the first statement or first option is A, Tamil Nadu, B, Andhra Pradesh, C, Chhattisgarh, or D, Odisha. So in this, the answer is Odisha. Now here, please don't get an idea that if you have not heard about it, you go about learning all the wildlife sanctuaries which are out there. No. Just look at those which have remained in news. Now why is it that Karlapat Wildlife Sanctuary was in news? So that is because elephants in this region, they started dying. And they started dying because of a disease that is hemorrhag hemorrhagic septicemia. Close to around eight to nine elephants, they died. So here, this is particularly situated in the Kalahandi district of Odisha. Now this hemorrhagic septicemia, it is actually expected or it is actually presumed that this is because of the contaminated or rather contaminated water which was present and the water was contaminated with the bacteria that is Pasteurella multocida. Now what this bacterium did was it significantly reduced the lung capacity and also brought in about a severe state of pneumonia into these elephants. And that is when the elephants they started dying. It was later found out with various investigations that the elephants, they drank water from a similar stream or the same stream. And that is when the water in that stream was also disinfected with bleaching powder, etc. So this kind of disease is not absolutely new. It does happen. It has happened before, especially in elephant population. But also, this disease also affects wild buffaloes. So this kind of infection or contamination is to be expected during the monsoon or just after the monsoon where many of the times you have water coming in and you have streams carrying the remains of certain decomposed animals, etc. And thereby they have bacterium infection there as well. Okay? So that is why knowing what hemorrhagic septicemia is, that is important and knowing that which particular wildlife sanctuary experienced that, that is also important. Next, with reference to Hemis National Park, consider the following statements. It is spread over two states. Now, where is Hemis National Park? It is present in the Union Territory of Ladakh. So the first statement is incorrect. Second. There are no human habitations 
inside the park. But if you go there, there are actually six to seven villages which are present. So this statement is also incorrect that there are no human habitations. Third, it is the only national park of India situated to the north of Himalayas. Now this is true because it is the only national park which is situated to the north of the three ranges of Himalayas that we know. That is the Himadri, Himachal and Shivalik. This national park lies in the region around Zaskar range and in the region around Trans Himalayas. So this lies in the region of Trans Himalayas. So the third statement is correct. Fourth, it is one of the natural habitats of the Kashmiri stag. Now Kashmiri stag is what is also referred to as Hangul. Now Hangul, even though it is not to be found in Hemis National Park, in the nearby area, that is in the Dachigam region, that is where you have the Hangul population and the Hangul population belongs there. So this is also one of the incorrect statements because Hangul is to be found in the Dachigam protected area. So here, which of the statements given above is or are correct? You have B, that is 3 only, which will be the correct answer. Now, next, Nargu Wildlife Sanctuary, which was again recently in news, is located in which of the following states? So A, Uttarakhand, B, Himachal Pradesh, C, Uttar Pradesh or D, Sikkim. So Nargu is located in the region around Himachal Pradesh. So B is the correct answer. But why was it recently in news? That was because the central government had designated a particular area as the eco-sensitive zone it had issued a notice. Now anybody having any issue or a problem regarding this notification will have to appeal within the designated time period, following which the chief warden or the state government will also declare a particular area as a protected area. Now why is it that such notifications are issued? These are issued to curb any kind of activities which can threaten the ecosystem. So be it drilling activities, be it construction activities, all the different types of activities, they are put to a halt. So from the core area, a diameter is chosen, a particular extent is chosen, and there is a declaration as a kind of a eco-sensitive zone. So Nargu Wildlife Sanctuary is spread across 132 square kilometers in the Mandi and Kulu districts of Himachal Pradesh. It harbors animals such as leopards, barking deer, black bear, goral, jackal, and flying squirrel and birds as well. Okay? Now, after that, moving on to the concept of biodiversity hotspots. So, which of the following criteria are considered by Conservation International to decide a particular area as a biodiversity hotspot. The first statement, extent of geographical area. Can the extent of geographical area decide whether a particular region is a hotspot or not? No. What is a hotspot? Hotspot is basically where the species diversity is so significant. There are n number of species living there. And also, the size of it is being threatened and it is being destroyed. So that is why it is referred to as a hotspot or a region where the biodiversity thrives. So extent of geographical area is incorrect. Then endemism, this is true. Third, annual rainfall. Annual rainfall can never determine whether an area is hotspot or not. So the correct answer will be A, that is 2 only. Now what is endemism? When we talk about endemism, generally there are certain species of both plants, animals, etc. 
which can grow in only one particular region, only one particular geographical area. They cannot survive across the globe. That is being endemic. So when we say that a particular animal or any plant is endemic to a region, that means that particular species will not be found anywhere else. There are certain species, even though they are present in increased concentration in a smaller region, but some traces are found in other places of the globe, that is not endemic. So Conservation International, it has given out two particular classifications or requirements for an area to be classified as a biodiversity hotspot. This term biodiversity hotspot in itself, it was propounded way back in 1988 by an individual named Norman Myers. It is Norman Myers who gave this idea of the hotspot. Now what are the requirements for an area to be classified as a hotspot? You have that a region should have at least 1500 species of vascular plants. That is, it should have a high degree of endemism. Those kinds of plant species which are to be found only in this area, nowhere else. It must contain 30% or less of its original habitat. That is, it must be threatened or endangered. So based upon these two criteria, across the globe, you have various different biodiversity hotspots which have been declared. In India, there are four different biodiversity hotspots which touch the country or which lie in the country in various different proportions. Which are those? So one is the Himalayan region, the Himalayas. The other is the region around Western Ghats. Here also you have a significant diversity. Then you have the Indo-Burma biodiversity hotspot which occupies the northeastern part. And then you also have the Sunda land which occupies Andaman and Nicobar. So these four are the biodiversity hotspots which lie in India. You have to be aware of these four questions can be asked and this will be categorized as an easy question which are the four areas of biodiversity hotspots okay now here with reference to the transport initiative for asia which of the following statements are incorrect first it is an initiative of asian development bank this is incorrect it is an initiative basically which was initiated by World Resources Institute. And here, along with various different members of different countries, for example, in India, it is the Niti Aayog, which is responsible or which is a nodal agency. Similarly, you have the uh, Transport International, which is also responsible. So you have different other types of member bodies, which have pooled in together to bring about a solution for the transportation sector, particularly across the globe and even in the regions of Asia, such as India, China, Vietnam, etc., to bring about transportation systems where the emission is controlled and to bring about electric mobility and to encourage it. So, the second statement, it aims to improve connectivity along the ancient route from Kolkata to Hanoi. This is incorrect. Third, Borders Roads Organization is the implementing partner in India. It is not. Which is the implementing partner? It is Niti Aayog. So, all the three statements are incorrect. So here, which of them are incorrect? You have D, that is 1, 2, and 3 being incorrect. Okay? Now, the next question. Now, rather the next topic, we shall be talking about Project Lion. Now, Project Lion was announced by the Prime Minister from the ramparts of Red Fort during his Independence Day address. 
Now, just on the lines of Project Tiger and Project Elephant, this Project Lion also talks about increasing the population of lions in our country. Now, in our country, lions are present or are restricted rather only in the Gir National Park or only in the region of Gir. Now, because of this, the lions have significantly reduced amount of genetic diversity. So any factor such as climate change or let's say water stress or any disease can plague the lions significantly. So since 1995 itself, there has been this discussion of shifting the lion population to other areas of spreading them so that there is a kind of a genetic diversity and there is a kind of a resilience within the lion population. So earlier for a long time, it was the Kuno Palpur Wildlife Sanctuary which was targeted. But now under the project lion, six other protected areas have been listed where the lions can be relocated. And lions from gear shall be relocated so that they can intermingle, they can adapt to different conditions. So you have Madhav National Park in Madhya Pradesh, then Sita Mata Wildlife Sanctuary in Rajasthan, Mukundara Hill Tiger Reserve again in the region of Eastern Rajasthan, Gandhi Sagar Wildlife Sanctuary in the region of Madhya Pradesh, Kumbhalgarh Wildlife Sanctuary in Rajasthan, and Jasor Balram Ambaji Wildlife Sanctuary and the adjoining landscape in the region of Gujarat. In all these different protected areas, you will notice one particular common thread. They are all grassland ecosystems. Either you will find grasslands or thorny forests with shrubs. So this tells you a significant detail about lion's habitat as well. Okay? Now, let's take a look at the questions. With reference to project lion, which of the following statements is or are incorrect? The first statement, it is a project to reintroduce African lion species in India. This is incorrect. Second, Sita Mata Wildlife Sanctuary, Rajasthan, is one of the sites that have been chosen for lion relocation project in India. This is correct as we have seen. So you have option A is the incorrect one. We had to choose the incorrect. So option A will be the correct answer. Now, a passage type of question from this itself. So the Maldhari community is a tribe of herdsmen in a border state of India. They derive their name Maldhari, which means the owner of goods or wealth, Maldhari. In this case, cattle are their goods or wealth. They have lived in a national park, in the Bunny Grassland Reserve area, which emerged from the sea as a result of tectonic activities. There are continued attacks by endangered carnivorous species on their cattle, but still they manage to live in harmony with that species. The community mentioned resides in which of the national park. So Maldhari community is particularly well known to be living together with the Asiatic lions and living in a peaceful manner for a very long time. So all the other different details that you get in the particular kind of passage that you can extract as additional information. Okay, so here you are talking about C, that is Gir National Park. Okay, next. Consider the following passage about a national park. It was established as a wildlife sanctuary in 1981 and has received national park status in 2018. It is considered a possible site for Asiatic re lion relocation and cheetah reintroduction project as well. Cheetah reintroduction had been in news throughout 2018, 19, and 20. This year, lion is in news. 
So, which of these protected areas are fit for both of them? If you look at it, gear is where they are already present. So, the answer here will be Kuno National Park. There, both cheetah and lion can be reintroduced. Then, recently, Asiatic lions from Nehru Zoological Park, Hyderabad, have tested positive for COVID-19. In this regard, consider the following statements. So, first, the COVID-19 infection from human to Asiatic lions has happened in India only. This is correct. It has not been observed in various other parts of the world as of now. The symptoms shown by Asiatic lions are completely different from humans. This is incorrect because they also have a kind of a similar symptoms regarding respiratory issues, loss of appetite, etc. Wildlife Institute of India has developed a vaccine against COVID-19 for Asiatic lions recently. This is as incorrect as it can be. In fact, it is only Russia which has developed a vaccine for animals and that vaccine is referred to as Carnivac. So both 2 and 3 are incorrect. So the answer in this case will be B, that is 1 only. Okay. Now, the last question. In the context of India's first snow leopard conservation center, consider the following statements. First, it is established in Uttarakhand under the Secure Himalaya project. Then, it is built in partnership with the United Nations Environment Program. Three, it, the snow leopard is listed as endangered by the IUCN red list. Now, snow leopard is not endangered. Earlier it was, but it has now been relegated to the vulnerable category. So, the third statement is incorrect. So, eliminate all of them wherever you have the third statement. So, the correct answer in this case will be B, that is 2 only. Now, why is it that snow leopard was relegated from endangered? Because the snow leopard, its area, it was found to be present across the Himalayan region, not only in India, but also in the regions of Pamirs, in the Central Asia, almost up to the region of Northern China. So the area was huge. And extrapolation on that area gave an idea that their population would also be quite significant. And that is why their the status was relegated from endangered to vulnerable. Even though their sighting is extremely rare, here you will find that in India they are found in Western Himalayas, Eastern Himalayas, in Western Himalayas in the region of Jammu Kashmir, Himachal Pradesh, in Eastern Himalayas in Uttarakhand and Sikkim and Arunachal Pradesh, all the mountainous areas. And Hemis National Park is one of those areas where you have significant amount of snow leopard population. So, even under Secure Himalaya project, snow leopard population is supposed to be increased in the Hemis National Park, which we have seen earlier as well. Okay? So, that concludes our session for today. Today, we have looked at various concepts, not only regarding various different species, their protected areas, and also the conservation methods. Hope this was beneficial for you guys. Thank you for being patient enough and please revise this, take care of yourself and good night. Thank you.